Welcome to the component Healthcare Data Analytics, Data Analytics in Clinical Settings. This is Lecture C. The component Healthcare Data Analytics covers the topic of healthcare data analytics, which applies the use of data, statistical and quantitative analysis, and explanatory and predictive models to drive decisions and actions in healthcare. The learning objectives for data analytics in clinical settings are to Describe the current state of data analytics in clinical settings. Identify key tools and approaches to improve analytics capabilities in clinical settings. Describe different governance and operation strategies in analytics and clinical settings. Discuss value-based payment systems and the role of data analytics in achieving their potential. And analyze data used in population management and value-based care systems. This lecture will focus on two main topics, data systems in support of innovative provider payment incentives and value-based consumer incentives, and population health data analytics to identify and proactively manage patients at risk of untoward events, such as death, hospitalization, or preventable medical complications. To understand the effect of data analytics relative to payments models, we need to understand some basics about payment models and why they're important to healthcare. A payment model simply refers to how you pay for some good or service. In healthcare, we're interested in both the quantity of services and the quality of service, or any non quantity features of the service. For instance, if we were looking at a hospital cost, we may look at the cost of the room per day in the hospital. In this case, the quantity could be the number of days in the hospital. The quality might be the size of the room or whether the room was private or only semi-private. Unfortunately, measuring quantity is difficult in healthcare. While it's straightforward to count the number of office visits or days in the hospital, what about reviewing a panel of patients who need an immunization? Similarly, quality is difficult to measure in healthcare. Are all surgeries of the same quality? If not, how do you measure the differences? If you can measure the differences, how do they affect health? These questions make it difficult to know how to pay for something, since you don't always know how much you'll get and what quality it will be. Since quality and quantity are hard to measure, various proxies are used for payment. The most common proxy is the count of services. A service is simply a billable item such as a pill, a visit, or a test. This leads to many items that need to be listed. An alternative method of payment is to pay for an episode of care. For this approach to be implemented, an episode would need to be defined, such as 90 days from the beginning of a knee replacement procedure. A single payment would be made, regardless of how many services were used. A third example of a payment model is the capitation model, which means payment per capita or per person. In this approach, a single payment is made per person regardless of how many services or episodes they need. It's also possible to capitate by type of service, called subcapitation. For instance, there may be a single payment for primary care or mental health care per month to handle any services that might be needed. Each of the models creates different incentives to provide too much or too little care, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture. There are two payment buzzwords that are worth knowing about. Shared savings and pay for performance. Various models of shared savings are common in healthcare. In the shared savings model, the difference in total payment under two proxy measures is split between the provider and payer. An example is a capitation services shared savings model. In this model, if the total payment calculated by adding up the cost of all the services needed is less than the capitation amount, the provider obtains some percentage of the difference and the remainder is savings to the payer. In a pay-for-performance model, a measure of quality is used as part of the payment formula. For instance, there may be a capitated payment rate that varies based on the readmission rate as a measure of quality. Because performance cannot be measured in all aspects, it's always combined with another method such as service payments, episode, or capitation. There are various provider payment models that are relevant to data analytics. For instance, innovative payment models typically create an economic incentive to decrease costs compared to being paid per service. When a payment is fixed across a bundle or a person, if the cost of the services provided is more than the payment amount, the provider can lose profits. 
Similarly, if the cost of services provided is less than the payment amount, the provider can earn profits. This chance for earning or losing profits is called risk. With cost and quality, outcomes are more important under innovative payment models, so demand for information is increased. However, it's not as simple to implement as it seems. The average charge master, or list of prices charged at a hospital, has over 5,000 unique prices, according to Kongstbead's Essentials of Managed Care. Compounding the complexity of the charge master is the fact that each payer, such as an insurer or government plan, has a different discount, though it is typically proportional across items. Thus, the question remains of how it's possible to make these data more accessible to providers and other decision makers trying to reduce cost and improve care. When would providers or patients want to see this kind of information? Are the costs important at time of ordering? Or perhaps only when reviewing cases to see why they were expensive? Another topic in payment models concerns the involvement of consumers. Instead of individuals choosing providers and receiving services paid for by the insurer, these models intend to have the consumer pay a portion of the cost. To do this, the plans incorporate higher out-of-pocket expenses through deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. The goal is to increase the incentive to search out quality and price information and decrease unnecessary services. Quality and price information would therefore be needed from the data analytics system. Recent studies have shown that prices were searched for in less than 5-10% to of services when these types of plans have been implemented. However, it's not clear if the information affects the services chosen. In fact, a quote from a recent study says, For 8 out of 9 services analyzed, prices paid by CDHP, Consumer Directed Health Plan, and traditional plan employees did not differ significantly. In theory, these plans may also increase the incentive for providers to supply this price and quality information to attract patients. However, most initiatives to provide this information have been at the state level, rather than initiated by providers, so that effect is less likely. If we assume consumers do want price and quality information, it's still not easy to know how to proceed. With so many billable items in a hospital setting, how could the data be made accessible? How could a cost for an episode be created from these billable items? There are a lot of questions because much of this hasn't been developed yet in the clinical setting. It's tempting to think that healthcare is unique because the inputs vary. However, there are other services we purchase where the specific inputs vary. In banking, a checking account has many potential costs for each transaction, customer service, website access, yet the overall cost of having the account is fixed or recovered by the account size through interest. Another topic of relevance for data analytics in clinical settings is the demand for population health data analytics. The first question is, what is population health? The common definition is that it is health outcomes of a group of individuals. The next question is, why is population health important? Due to the randomness involved in how healthcare improves health, and other determinants of health, it's not always known if care is, in fact, improving outcomes. However, across a group of individuals, it is possible to measure an outcome and track changes. This approach allows patterns based on population factors to be considered, including the physical and social environment. What does population health entail for data analytics? The primary concern relates to what kind of metrics are relevant and how they should be accessed. An ideal population health outcome metric has been described in Parrish's 2010 article as having four characteristics. In general, it should reflect a population's dynamic state of physical, mental, and social well-being. Positive health outcomes might include being alive, functioning well mentally, physically, and socially, and having a sense of well-being. Negative health outcomes might include death, loss of function, and lack of well-being. Diseases and injuries are considered intermediate factors that influence the likelihood of achieving a state of health, but are not health itself. A big issue with population health outcome metrics relates to the idea of surrogate endpoints of the ideal health outcomes described previously. Surrogate endpoints are metrics that are not the ultimate health outcome or endpoint, but are believed or shown through evidence to be reliable indicators of positive or negative health outcomes. 
Some examples include the HbA1c level for diabetics or blood pressure and cholesterol for other types of patients. These metrics are common to population health data analytics. Population health also highlights the role of prevention of negative health through screenings for various conditions such as colon abnormalities and depression. This slide presents a longer list of metrics provided by the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, that concern population health. The table lists the most frequently recommended health metrics for community health assessments or population health improvements. The table shows the difference between health outcome metrics and health determinant and correlate metrics. The health outcomes are categorized as to whether they relate to mortality and morbidity. The health determinants and correlate metrics are split into metrics relating to healthcare access and quality, health behaviors, demographics and social environment, and the physical environment. Examples of the morbidity health metric include measures of obesity and low birth weight. Other metrics include health insurance coverage, tobacco use, race, and air quality. Each of these types of measures may be needed for a well-functioning population health data analytic system. Population health is frequently implemented at the clinic level by managing the panel of patients the clinic is responsible for. A panel of patients is the list of patients for which a provider or set of providers is managing the care. The size ranges from 200 for highly specialized providers to 3,500 or more for less intensive types of primary care for largely healthy populations. For example, a primary care physician or PCP may have 2,400 patients attributed to her or him. While only some are requiring or requesting appointments, the physician is a primary point of contact for their health needs. When managing a panel, the data analytics typically require two main features. First, the providers will need access to recent or current encounters. These may consist of prescriptions, laboratory values, test results, emergency department visits, or hospital visits. Second, it's ideal if the analytics can link to other data, such as public health information about the patient's environment or socioeconomic status. The data analytics will frequently manifest in the form of a dashboard, which allows the providers to have efficient ways to obtain information about their panel of patients. This slide shows an example of a dashboard from a private company called Health Catalyst. A close look shows that the dashboard provides color-coded metrics about whether each patient is meeting relevant metrics and if various services are overdue. The dashboard also summarizes the patient-level data to provide statistics that can be analyzed to see if population health is improving or declining. This concludes Lecture C of Data Analytics in Clinical Settings. In this lecture, we introduce some payment models that have implications for the demands of data analytics. In particular, the demand for quality and cost information. We also discussed the concept of population health and how it affects the type of metrics we're interested in. A key example included the concept of primary care providers managing a panel of patients and the kind of dashboard they may find useful.